This is my pleasure to introduce uh, Boris Dalstein, 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 Great. Um, who did uh, his PhD in Vancouver. Uh, that's some kind of a proof that uh, once you finish your PhD, uh, there is life after. No you way. Can, no. <laughs> uh, and then you uh, you might even be so thrilled by uh, your own research that you might have your own startup about your research. So if you think that this is cool, this is then one good reason to give a, an award to somebody who, uh, who after three to four years of working on something, wants to continue working on the same thing and make it a product. So that's, uh, that's well deserving. That well, we'll see that. Yeah. There's no product yet. <laughs> so you get a tiny stick. Yeah, that's what you get for the, uh, that part. So anyway, uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop taking some time from uh, uh, Boris' uh, presentation. And uh, I'll be sitting in the back. So if you have questions, you look back at me. You hold your hand. And I'll uh, point to you, say, next question and next one. PhD doesn't qualify him to call on people himself. That could work. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he's not becoming uh, uh, academia, so yes. probably that doesn't. <laughs> so anyway, Boris. All right. Well, sorry for the introduction. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Pierre, for uh, the introduction. So I'm going to talk about uh, my thesis, which is topological modeling for vector graphics. Um, but first of all, because I've, before I run out of time and skip that, let's just do it out of the way. Uh, you can do a PhD by yourself, right? So I would like to thank, like, first of all, my supervisor, uh, Michael van der Pan, who's been like, so amazing supporting me all those years. And my master thesis supervisor, Rémi Ronfard, <coughs> like, which is basically the subject I started with him. And obviously, like all of the like, award committee for giving me the chance to talk here, and uh, Pierre Poulain for helping the organizations and like, the whole graphics interface conference, Vancouver Foundation, which apparently gives me the money. Um, and uh, oh, all my... The money, uh, sorry, this is, uh, we don't have budget. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, no, it comes with a nice oh, well then, sorry guys. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, and obviously all the supervisory committee, the university examiners, the external examiner, the chair of my PhD defense, who was like so helpful. Uh, right, so let's go straight to it. So I'm going to talk about vector graphics. So I assume most of you have a sense of what that is, but let's just give a quick overview to make sure. So you have two ways to represent images, right? You can use like a grid of pixels. So this is if you use Photoshop, for instance. Or you can use vector graphics, like you can use Adobe Illustrator, where in that case you represent shapes by describing them uh, mathematically. So let's say you have a circle and with a given radius uh, and stuff. So the benefit of vector graphics is that it's resolution independent. So you can zoom as much as you want. It's still going to be sharp. Uh, it has better semantics. So by semantics, I mean that the software knows that it's a circle because it's written, oh, this is a circle with this radius. And so with this knowledge of knowing it's a circle, it's easier to edit. You just have a few parameters. You change those parameters, like the thickness of the outline, and, and then you get a new image. So it's much easier to edit. So what can you do with vector graphics? So you might think, oh, we can just do like illustrations, which are resolution independent. Why not? So usually people think of like icons, for instance. Uh, people use vector graphics to do icons. Um, you can do, use it for interactive data visualization. So because you have this semantics, well, you can easily interact with the drawing in ways that you couldn't do with pixels. Uh, but in fact, it's really so pervasive everywhere. So if you have text rendered, well, that's a font and it's vector graphics. If you use documents, like this presentation is just completely vector graphics or like operating systems. If you just uh, use your phone and you move stuff around, you click, like it's all vector graphics. So actually, it's a pretty important and big topic. Um, and in fact, vector graphics is very, very old. And you can even consider that it's like the oldest subfield of computer graphics that ever existed. So if some of you are in HCI, you probably know the work by uh, Sutherland in 1963, who basically created the first graphical interface ever. So he used this um, like computer um, or like this uh, like screen display, like vector display screen, and he was able to like draw 
lines and interact with them. So all of this is vector graphics. So he basically invented vector graphics and computer graphics with it. Um, so there's been a lot of research since then. So 1963, this is like, like uh, 55 years ago. Um, so you can imagine there's been a lot of advances. And so what do I want to add to vector graphics? Like, wh what can you improve like today? And so what I'm actually focusing on is topological modeling for vector graphics. So by topological modeling, I mean you want to have curves and shapes, and you want to represent connections between those shapes. But in fact, Sutherland did that already. So this is in the abstract of his thesis, like the abstract of one of the most famous theses in the history of computer graphics. And his written sketchpad stores explicit information about the topology of a drawing. So if a user moves one vertex of a polygon, then both adjacent sides will be moved. Uh, if the user moves the symbol, all lines attached to that symbol will automatically move to stay attached to it. So that seems very basic and already Sutherland had it. But in fact, if you open Adobe Illustrator today, like just do it if you have it installed, you just draw like three paths using like the basic path tool, and you try to connect those three to a same junction, like, like you see here, actually you can't do that. Illustrator is going to tell you, oh, I can do that. I can just connect this thing in the middle of another like, path or something. So, so it's true. So what you see here, like Sutherland, 50, 50, 55 years ago, moving these lines together, actually you cannot do that in Adobe Illustrator today, last version. I hope I'm still correct. Uh, last time I tried. <laughs> Um, so there's a question like what happens, why we don't have that today? And I'm going to kind of explain um, like what I did to try to improve that and why it's actually <coughs> more complicated than you might, you might think. So yes? If you group them, seriously? You can, uh, so you can make a group and then move all of them together? Yeah. There's no way to select the, like the, the, the incident point of all those lines and move them. So what you can do is just select all of them. So somebody is saying, yeah, so there are ways to do it. So you could just select the three paths and then select all three control points, which is the end of those things together, and move them. But Illustrator doesn't know that they are connected. You have to manually select the three endpoints together. So that there are ways like, like people survive, people do great artwork. Uh, but still, actually, Illustrator doesn't know about the connection between those lines. Yep. Uh, and actually, it does create some problems for rendering. Actually, if you want like a nice like joint, like sometimes you, well, you, you could just like draw the outline yourself. But so there are limitations to to what you can hack to make it work. Um, so basically, what Adobe Illustrator stores, and which is very similar to the file format SVG, is a list of paths. So you can create open path, or you can create closed path. You can uh, fill them with a given color. Uh, and by creating a lot of those paths together, stacked on top of each other's, then you can create arbitrarily complex uh, drawings, uh, such as here, this cat. But the issue is that in this case, you don't really have the knowledge of the shared edge between the different shapes. So here, actually what the software sees are different shapes. It doesn't know that those are connected. And also, you don't have multi-way joints. So this is what we saw like in the earlier example. So those are, would actually be stored as completely independent path. So it's, it's, it's harder to edit. And so here's another example. Um, um, you would have to use like many different paths to actually represent that thing. And you would actually use a separate path just for the color. So this means that if you want to edit the boundary of, of, of this leg, then you'd have to edit each of those individually, both the outline and the coloring, So, which is kind of time, like time consuming. So in total, this one, for instance, you would have to use all of these different paths. So you could choose a different way to do it, but this is one way you could do it. Uh, so in order to kind of solve that problem and try to, add this, to have this topology and those connections, uh, what you can do is use planar maps. So in a planar map, you start with, um, with a set of strokes as input, and then you would compute all of the intersections uh, between those strokes. 
And then from those intersections, you can define regions of the plane. And from these regions, uh, so uh, using this kind of data structure, you actually have uh, the connection information. So it's usually represented using a half edge data structure, and you can just traverse that data structure. And so you are aware of multi-way joints like here, and you do have the shared edge information between the different regions. However, you can see that if you use this data structure, you cannot actually overlap shapes on top of each other's. So in this case, you would have these areas uh, on the face of the cat, which would be cut by the whiskers, uh, because that's just what planar map does. It just like cuts everything where the edges are. Uh, but semantically, this doesn't really make sense. I mean, like the whiskers shouldn't cut the face or something like that. Um, so the reason it happens, as I said, is that you would have those new vertices created when you intersect the edges together. And instead, we'd like not to have intersection between all pairs of edges. We'd prefer to have something like this on the left, where the intersection between some of the lines are actually not tracked. So the same way here, we wouldn't want to have those intersections, but instead we'd kind of like to, um, to kind of like glue those edges to the middle of a face. But you can't do that with planar maps. So in other words, planar maps can't support overlapping. Like everything becomes just like a flat drawings, everything is intersected, and you cannot have this nice way to put shapes on top of each other that, that don't interact together. Uh, so this is another example of things which are hard with planar maps. If you represent this with planar map, you cannot just easily, let's say, extend this leg because you would have vertices here at the connection. So if you want to do something like this, you couldn't do it. So just to compare uh, the two representations that we've seen, so either you use the SVG kind of representation, in which case you can't, it's possible to have overlapping but you can't have shared edges or multi-way joints. On the other hand, you can use planar maps, but then, um, so if you use that, you do have those shared edges and those multi-way joints, so kind of like what Sutherland had, but it's impossible to have overlapping shapes because the whole thing just become one map, like, like um, um, a partition of the space. So what we do um, in our research is to implement, to, well, to define a new data structure, which we call a vector graphics complex, which actually kind of have the best of the uh, both worlds. So you have both shared edges and multi-way joints, but you also keep the ability to have overlapping. So here's um, a very quick uh, demo of how it works in practice. So I have like uh, the cat already partially drowned and I'm going to draw like a new stroke to complete the ear. And because we actually represent all of those connections, it's easy to just use the paint bucket tool and fill the area with the given color. And then you can move the connections between those lines and it behaves the way it's intended. So now we'll try to see how to represent like the whiskers. So if you do the same as uh, what I just did, so by default, the software would actually compute all the intersections like a planar map. This is kind of the default mode. But then if you do that, as we see, we have this unintended separation uh, of the face. So what we will do is actually to change the mode and instead use something more like SVG or Adobe Illustrator where we would not compute the intersection between those. So now you can see that those are actually like all independent paths. They are just like on top of each other's stacked. But what we can do is split this edge into two edges and then glue the end of the whiskers with the new vertex that we just created. So here I just select the two of them and I just hit glue. And now those two are glued together. So we'll just do it three times. So we create a new vertex and then we glue it to the whisker. We create a new vertex and we glue it to the whiskers. So now that we've done that, it's possible to edit the drawing in a way that actually respects the correct semantic of this drawing, which is the whiskers is actually connected to the mouth, 
but it's not connected to the face. And now I'm going to do basically the same thing, but with the other whiskers. Uh, but instead of connecting them directly to the line, I want to attach them like, to the middle of the face itself. Mm. So what I can do is actually create new vertices in the middle of the face. I, I call that a Steiner vertex. It's kind of a point in face uh, topological structure. So once you create those like new vertices like inside the face, you can do the same and glue them to the end of the whisker. And so once you do that, then you have the correct semantic for, for your drawing. So things you can do as well. I think I'm going to skip that, all right, just to save some time. So you can wonder um, what exactly is the data structure and how did we arrive to that data structure. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually explain uh, kind of design decisions, like things that we wanted to support, and how the design decisions led to the data structure that we have now. So things we want is basic <coughs> primitives. Like we want to be able, at the <coughs> very least, to create points. We want to be able to create edges. And we want to be able to create at least triangles. I'm not saying that you should all just decompose your thing in a triangle. But at least if somebody wants to create a triangle, well, that should be possible. And then we want to have basic topological operators. So if you have two vertices, you want to be able to glue them. If you have an edge, you want to be able to cut it in the middle, the new vertex. You want to be able to glue edges together. And we want to be able to cut a face with a new edge. Then we want those operators to be invertible. So if you want to be able to cut an edge with a vertex, well, we also want to be able to do the opposite, which is if you have an edge, you want to be able to kind of delete or like uncut uh, that edge. And another thing we want, which is more um, like arguable, we want something called operator locality, which means that if that the validity of an operation only depends on local property. So for instance here, because we said that it's possible to uncut an edge, like to kind of delete a vertex in the middle of an edge, we want to be able to do it no matter if this edge is actually a closed edge or an open edge. And the reason is that uh, it's not always obvious for artists to know if it's a closed edge or not, if the drawing is complex and the edge is very long, or like those kind of things. So with those, um, uh, with those design decisions, we actually arrive at quite a complex like topological model. Uh, for instance, just because we want to allow every two vertices to be glued, that means we need to support non-planar graphs. Because if you can glue edges, uh, if you can glue vertices, well, you can create like K5, for instance, which is non-planar. And as well, if you allow to have triangles, and if you allow any two edges to be glued, then you could actually just represent the Mobius strip, which means that you should actually support the representation of non-orientable surfaces. Uh, as a consequence, you can actually see that that means that uh, you should actually be able to support overlapping as a consequence of the design decisions, because it's impossible to represent the Mobius strip in a plane uh, without overlapping. But if it was not a consequence, we would just add it in the design decision, because that's useful anyway. Um, so as well, so we need to represent non-manifold structures. So here have like a three-way connection. Uh, so this is another example of non-manifoldness. Uh, you need to be able to represent like fan edges. So if you have three triangles and you just glue them with the same edge, then you could have those kind of configurations. And as well, you can mix kind of like faces with edges and have those kind of mixed dimensional uh, topologies. Um, and also, we said that we allow triangles, but if you allow to cut the edges, then well, we allow then like squares, like pentagons, and as many uh, polygons that you want. Because we want to allow to uncut uh, all edges, uh, that means we need to support closed edges as well, because if you uncut an edge where the two end vertices are glued together, you get a closed uh, curve. So it's a closed edge. So more subtle, if you allow to glue any two edges, then if you glue the two end edges of a rectangle, 
you get this kind of like a torus like like disc with a hole in it and if you uncut that edge in the middle then you get a face with a hole inside so that means we need to support those kind of things as well uh, so obviously you can do the same with like several kind of holes and even more complicated Suppose that you create this thing. So the artist is kind of going crazy. So he's drawing these things. They have a rectangle. And he decides to glue, to glue the two edges over there to these things. And then he decides to kind of delete those edges in the middle, because why not? Then you get that shape over there. And topologically, <coughs> if you look at that thing, it actually, it's a torus. So it's a, an orientable surface of genus 1. So this thing is actually non-planar, and it's represented as just one single face. So that means that our data structure must somehow represent <coughs> faces, just one single face. It, may, it might be non-orientable, or like non-planar, at least. This is very different from a triangle mesh, for instance. So if you just represent a mesh using a triangle mesh, well, a triangle is assumed to be planar. By planar, I mean it can be embedded in the, in the plane. It might be bended, like curved, <coughs> but it, may, it must be embeddable in the plane. So in our data structure, we don't assume that. So the same can be done. You could just glue two edges of, uh, of this kind of uh, shape and then uncut, and you get a Mobius strip, which is like non-orientable. So basically, we need to support all of these kind of things over there. Like it has to support like non-planar topologies, non-orientable topologies, like uh, non-manifold things. Um, and actually, it's kind of there were no existing data structure to date that was able to actually do that. So that's why we needed to uh, implement our own, which actually is not that complicated. But uh, so here, I'm just going to skip the whole detailed comparison and just go to the data structure. So it's actually quite simple. So we have vertices, then we have edges, which can be either um, open, like this one, and with two end vertices, or they can be closed as well, like this edge. We have half edges, which we define as an edge mm -hmm. with a given direction. So half edges can be open or they could be closed. And then we can define a cycle, which is simply like a path of half edges, which go back to the same vertex. And using the cycles, we can define uh, faces by just having a list of cycles. So here, this is a face with a one cycle. And here, you have a face with three cycles to be able to represent holes inside of them. And this is an example where. Uh, one of the cycle could actually just be one vertex. And so this is how you allowed to glue whiskers in the middle. Um, but having all of those uh, data structure actually makes some topological operator non-obvious. So if you consider this simple cut, so you have one face with two vertices, two edges, and one face. And you want to, okay, this is just, ugh. So you have this face, all right? And you want to cut this face in the middle. Then this means that your face becomes two faces, F1 and F2. So you can like <coughs> look around and see, okay, F1 must be defined by E1, then E cut, and F2 must be defined by E2, and E cut minus ones. Uh, so that's all good. So yes. How, how do you determine the direction for a half uh, So you don't read really determine, oh, you mean? Yeah, so basically each edge, so when you draw an edge, you just give an, intri an intrinsic direction, well, by default, like the direction of drawing, but it doesn't really matter. You just choose one, and you say, this is the positive direction. And then a half edge would be, oh, is it the intrinsic direction, or is it the other one? And basically, it doesn't matter what the choice of the intrinsic. It, uh, as long as half edges together are consistent, then that would work. So that kind of define your cut operators, um, which is just like purely algebraic, in fact. But then what if you want to apply this cut to a different configuration, for instance, this Mobius cut over there? 
if you just apply, um, so by the way, you can see that this Mobius strip is actually exactly the same topology of this one. You could just modify the geometry and you would go from one to the other. And if you apply the same cut operator that we saw before, actually what you get is non-trivial. Like you get this uh, result if you apply this operator that we just saw. So this hints that this single cut operator that we define actually doesn't apply to all situations. Sometimes you need to do something different. And in this case, what you have to do is actually, instead of transforming your face into two faces, you actually need to transform your face into a single face, but just by adding this E cut at different places of the cycle. And so this kind of hints to the fact that there are different ways to cut a face. Um, so if you want to cut kind of a, some, a face that represents a planar surface, then you would use the cut above. And if you want to cut a face that represents a Mobius trap, then you would have to cut using the other algebraic operator. But in fact, uh, I shown in my research that there are many ways that you may want to cut a face if those faces might represent like non-orientable surfaces, like a, like a torus, that would be a different algebraic operation as well. And all of these is because despite um, representing the topology, like the connections between those uh, surfaces, we also allow them to overlap. <coughs> and because we added that ability, then we also have uh, those kind of weird cuts that we need to allow that other um, like software usually don't have to consider because they can't represent like non-orientable surfaces, for example. And this is kind of why, well, this is kind of my guess, but why in Illustrator you don't have those connections while Sutherland had them. So Sutherland didn't have coloring. It just had line drawings. So it couldn't define a color. And with line drawings, then topology is pretty easy. It's like, well, OK, you have lines, and you connect them, and you represent that. It's just a graph, right? It's pretty simple. But then as long, and, and the graph could be non-planar, so you could have like overlapping between those lines. That's fine. Uh, but as long as you have coloring as well, then if you have coloring plus overlapping edges, and then you manipulate them, and then you start to apply topological operators to them, then you get non-orientable um, like non surfaces or non-planar surfaces. And this is much harder to support. So I think this is why um, you don't have that in, in Adobe Illustrator, for instance, why you could have it uh, in Sutherland work, it's just because Sutherland didn't have faces. So it's way easier, in fact, to do these kind of things. Um, so I think I just wrap it up, like wrap up my talk, because it's already 26 minutes. So I wanted to talk about animation as well. How do you, how can you animate like all of these things? But I guess you can just have a talk to me if you want to uh, later. Um, so I just want to conclude because I need to do some marketing. That's important uh, since I'm here. All right. So to summarize, <laughs> I've shown beautiful new theoretical foundations of vector graphics topology. It's very cool math. Check out my thesis. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I implemented so this vector graphics complex, which is basically an implementation of this new like algebraic operators and things like that. And what you didn't see is that you can actually animate all of these, and it's possible to animate them even when the topology changes over time, which is pretty cool. Uh, and I'm trying to develop uh, like a new app, like a new tool, which I call VGC, uh, to commercialize all of these uh, things. Uh, but it's actually open source. So I hope that people are going to give money to use it. Uh, but I want to keep it open source. So if you want to try it out, you can actually just go to uh, this address. So right now, there's pretty much nothing for this one. But you can have a link from this link to the prototype I use to make all my demos um, of today. Um, and there you go. And I have a Patreon page if you like this project and you want to chip in a few dollars and if you think that's interesting. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs>
two minutes. No, no, no. So, uh, really cool stuff, by the way. Um, Thank you. So you're trying to make money through Patreon? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, it's just a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at first, yes. Yeah, okay. So if you're interested in my business model, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. just, just briefly, right? Basically, I made money by doing internships in the yeah. Bay Area. They yes. pay well. And now I have enough savings yeah, yeah. to live instead of the Bay Area in France, which is way cheaper. So I think I can survive two or three years like that. <laughs> and, and now, uh, so for now, I just have Patreon, but so then I'm going to sell the software. Uh, no, uh, behind, sorry. Okay, right. First of all, congratulations. Uh, oh, thank you. I really enjoyed, uh, yeah, we can. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've enjoyed reading your work as it's been published. Uh, I really like uh, the way that it's uh, exposed. Um, I had uh, one question, like you mentioned, like the illustrator like supports or doesn't support yeah. these kind of things. Like people come up with tricks to do these kind of things, which is kind of, like if you think of it in terms of there's a underlying representation and then there's a UI, yeah. you're proposing to cha fundamentally change the underlying representation That's true. Yeah. in the hope that it exposes maybe better UI or yeah. more. Yeah. So where, like, where, did you, where do you draw the line? Like at, at what point is it a UI thing and it doesn't need to go into the underlying representation? I, I have yeah, a yeah. feeling you've thought about this a lot. So. so where do I draw the line? I think as long as you want to draw illustrations, static drawing, then it's fine, and Illustrator is amazing. Uh, but for animation, this is where if you want to, uh, you have those connections and you want to keep this connection during the animation, you don't want to have three times the data of where those should move while still keeping like this connection, especially if you kind of start to use like more involved like interpolation schemes, then depending on the keyframes you have, they will start to diverge and you will see the gap. So this is where I think, for animation, it's really important, I, I think. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Because you didn't yeah. talk about the animation. Yeah, uh, sorry. Work. So were there any things, if I understand the cr chronology, the animation came after the vector graphics complexes, right? Yeah, well, uh, the animation is what I wanted to work first. But so then, I wonder if yeah. you like, regretted any choices you made in the vector graphics complexes once you started flushing out the animation work? Or was there anything like, oh, we would Actually, no. Like, it's uh, because... Lucky. <laughs> no, because, because what I wanted is to do animation. And I tried to do it. And I just didn't have a data structure to do what I needed. So actually, I designed the vector graphics complex to work perfectly for animation. So it actually does. Yeah. Yes? We need use the term animation, we think of you know, full time sequence, history or whatever style. But even <coughs> if something as simple as writing a technical paper on some arbitrary data structure where you've designed a diagram, and I've done this, you then need the diagram that shows what does the data structure look like after some operation. Mm -hmm. And it's the same data structure with a little bit of change, but usually things have moved around. And I don't use Illustrator, but from what you say, you can't do that in Illustrator. Yeah, so, but and even, even simpler than that is when you're designing one single illustration, my experience is, yeah. you lay it out, it looks kind of right, and then you realize, that, oh, yeah. I've got to put you're so correct. this text box or label in, and I'm going to have to move things, yeah. because it was arbitrary what I, where I put them, but now they need to be someplace else, yeah. and there's all this connection. You're 100% correct, and actually, that really points to animating, and being able to edit is kind of the same thing. You have like some like drawing and you want to change it. So either you want to track those changes and actually output an animation, or you just want the new one is the same. And that really leads to the semantics. If you want to edit something easily, either for animation or because you're not happy anymore with your shape, then for editing, you need good semantics and, and basically this data structure provides a better semantic than if they are just all disconnected. Yes? Uh, sir, oh, well, just one final follow-up. So I think there's a, a very strong analogy to sort of what we've learned in, uh, say, software engineering, but it's the baby version of it, is you know, a good, well-designed software anticipates 
the modifications you might make. So you structure things into modules, et cetera, with some idea of what you may want to do in the future. And of course, there's a skill and the experience that go into that. And I think the same thing is here. The way you would structure one of these diagrams is with some intuition about how it might be modified and which the pieces are, because you probably still have some, some freedom as to whether to build those things in or not. So in some ways, it's also like the engineering concept of design for test, where you put extra stuff in that's not really needed, but it sure is needed if you're going to modify or test Yeah, it. for maintainability, obviously, yeah. Well, actually, I didn't mention, uh, but if you don't want to represent those connections, you don't have to. So in fact, the model is a superset of like SVG, for instance. If you just want to have independent path like stacked on top to each other's, well, you can still do it. So if it turns out to be too complicated in a UI perspective or that it confuses people, well, maybe the UI could most of the time do the same as Illustrator. But just in some cases where it's actually useful to do it, then you would represent those connections, yes. So we should move on to that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, so Morris. Yeah, let's, let's talk after. <laughs>